two and 14 to the national championship. And he scored the winning goal. He scored a lot of goals in the championship game. So he, he, you know, he's this, he is a very famous person within the Princeton lacrosse circle for, for him being kind of a part of the old, you know, when they were losing a, a lot, unfortunately. And then all of a sudden he was the winning goal and double overtime. So uh, yeah. he is a character of characters. I love it. I tried to track him down. Uh, it, it looks like he's got like Good a luck. furniture shop. It looks like he's got a furniture shop down in Portland, Oregon. So I sent him the, I sent him the video. We'll see if we'll see if he replies. I would, he, he will. Let, let's just say that Andy is a, um, uh, Moses is, is, is uh, tough to get a hold of. We lost touch <laughs> with Moses for quite a long time. And uh, he just started sprouting up again. And yes, he is a furniture um he makes beautiful uh, yeah. furniture um, and he's done it in all kind of different areas. So uh, interesting person, super wonderful person and, uh, and a great story. Yeah. Well, people are starting to funnel on in as you come on in, say hello in the chat. Um, Scott, thank you so much for, for taking more of your time to kind of answer some questions. I, um, and this is Scott Bacigalupo week around lax goalie rats. So on Tuesday, we released the, the video that we were just talking about, about the 92 game. Um, on Wednesday, yesterday, we released the full podcast. Just great, great stuff. I recommend if you guys haven't checked those out, check them, check them both out. And then I wanted to bring Scott back for some, for some live Q and a, um, maybe it's more selfish cause I've got a lot of questions, but I know, uh, you guys do too, as well. Some folks have written in questions who can't make it. Uh, we are recording this, so I'll throw up a, I'll throw up a, um, I'll throw it up on YouTube after we're done. But there's a Q and A box. If you guys have some questions, um, put them in the Q and A box, and if not, we can jump into the some of the questions that um, that we have uh, that that have written uh, um, that people wrote in. Um, the defense, Scott, the defense that you guys ran at Princeton. Was there any sort of any special elements to that or was it pretty much like slide from the crease coma slide kind of make sure yep. we've got the two slide organized what what kind of defense did you guys run yeah so um we you know it's really so the defense we ran uh really uh you know we went really on a limb when we, we called it tiger defense so uh <laughs> coach t really wasn't uh, thinking too much when he when he named it but it was our tiger defense and 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 what i would say is and what i love about it is you know Bill, Bill was the assistant coach at Hopkins before he came to Princeton. So a lot of the, the, I think what was going on through coach T's head and the basis of this defense, it then evolved when he got to Princeton. And now it's actually kind of cool because, you know, the, the defense that I watch today has all the elements of what he really was uh, the leader in teaching back when we first started, which was to your point, we had rules. Rules were you never let somebody sweep. Everybody had to go down the alley. We slid from the crease uh, up front. And then when attackmen dodged from behind, uh, you know, the defenseman would turn them inside. And as you said, the coma come across was the slide. And then you had the backside slide. Um, and then there was always some, and then, so that was the, that's the classic tiger defense that we played. And then the nuances became, um, you know, you push out adjacent to, to make it a little bit harder for them to pass the ball around. Uh, mm -hmm. Knowing that we were sliding from the crease, we were always pinching from behind, um, you know, and, and what, what the evolution was uh, going back was, you know, the slide packages before Coach Tierney really, I, I think really developed this, was we always slid adjacent, right? The, that, that was the slide package was adjacent. And then this whole sliding from the crease became, you know, the, the Hopkins way, but, but coach Tierney coming to Princeton and making it the Princeton way. And so the, the slide across uh, from, the, from the crease up top and then the come across below as you turn the attackman into, into you became very much the staple. And even today I watch a lot of, you know, games, we were just talking about it. And those are, they seemingly are still the rules by which defenses play by. Um, with a lot of nuances and, and deviations they've had, but it seems to be that that's lasted the, the test of time for the, for the time being, but it was called, it was called tiger lacrosse. 
I love it. I love it. Yeah. yeah it, it, like, even if you play pickup with like random, random defensemen and middies, you know, like that's kind of like the, the default nowadays is like we slide from the crease and then, uh, and then the coma slide. So the tiger Correct. It was called the tiger. <laughs> it was tiger D back then for us, but I'm sure everyone's got tiger their own D. names. That's yeah. nice. Um, Haley asked a question. Was there ever a time you wanted to stop playing or you got really discouraged? Uh, well, geez, great, great, great question. Uh, discouraged. Yes. I mean, Damon, you and I both know as a goalie, um, you get, you can be discouraged a lot. And I think we talked a little bit about the, um, you know, the emotions that you have to live with as a goalie in lacrosse, right? You have highs and you have some low moments. And, um, and so to Haley, yes, there was many times you, we, I was discouraged. There was many times that I was upset with how I was playing. There's many times as a goalie where you would lose a game and, and you, you blame yourself as a goalie because you are the last line of defense and so it's always upsetting when you let those goals in and, and you have to, and you have to, you know, bounce back from all of those things. I, I will point you to a time my sophomore year in, in college at Princeton, um, you know, we, we had come, we'd lost in the quarterfinals in this famous game against Towson state where we lost in triple overtime. And then sophomore year, we come out and now we're ranked uh, as Princeton. We were ranked really high and we lose to Hopkins 15, 14, and it was, you know, it was the most goals I'd ever given up in a, in a college game. And it was upsetting because I always thought about that double digits. You can't let up more than double digits in a, in a game as a goalie. We lost 15-14 and it was a terrible game. I was, I was really upset. And um, we played another game against UVA and we won. And then we went down to North Carolina and we lost to North Carolina. And, and, and we were ahead and we lost in the fourth quarter. And I, I gave up a couple goals in the, in the fourth quarter. We ended up losing. So... Here we are. We we thought we were we were hot stuff, and being ranked in the top whatever we were top five, top ten, and we were one and two, and I was super discouraged by the beginning of the season, um, and so um, and then we went to the Ivy Leagues and we ended up doing quite well. But yeah, we're goalies are always discouraged, right? I mean, we're, we're always having our ruts, and the question is, how do you get out of those ruts? Do you practice harder? What do you do, um, and and how do you react when you have a bad game, and you have another bad game? You know, do you how discouraged do you get, and how do you bounce back? And the mental this is the whole mental part of being a goalie. And all goalies who are out there, you're the only ones that know what it's like to be a goalie. But the mental aspect of it, to me, I think I've said this, you know, often in the public world, the mental part of goalie is is a large percentage of playing the position because of because of what you go through. So discouragement is uh, is often and um, and so uh, you have to you have to deal with it. Right. And it's it's much like, um, you know, we lost to Towson State um, in my freshman year and it was triple overtime. And I looked at T and as I said to you, Damon. I was so discouraged by losing. I then said, we'll never lose an overtime ever again. And it, th that was discouragement turned positive because I said, I don't want this feeling ever again. And, um, and we were lucky enough not, not to lose an overtime ever, ever after that. So. Yeah. I never lost an overtime either. So on this call, the two representatives are- There we uh, go. Only one loss in overtime. The, the only one, one, I was going to say, don't forget, I had one loss, so- Almost go. two in my sophomore year, but yes. Almost, almost. Um, yeah, it's interesting. The, um, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword because as lacrosse goalies, like when you get discouraged, it can go, it can go downhill really fast when you lose that mental, that mental edge. But the other edge of that is, is it can go uphill really fast. Like I've seen lacrosse goalies find confidence, right? And then just explode. I had... Um, the Navy goalie, uh, Matt Russell on, and he wasn't even starting at the beginning of the year. Like he was the backup and he ends up winning yep. goalie of the year that year. Right. So like yep. once you find your confidence, you can really explode. I think more so than any other position, like not attack, not D not middies, like goalies can really, once they get that confidence, they can really. I agree. I mean, Matt, Matty Russell, what, what, a, what a, what a wonderful goalie. And he, what a great career at the Naval Academy. I'll tell you another one that I always think of who, when you talk about, 
you know, confidence is Tillman Johnson for, for Virginia. I mean, he, he had a final four of epic final fours when he, when he led them. And it was just, the confidence was just um, brewing from, from how he was playing. And he was just a dominant person in the, in the, in the pipes when he played. So, so, and, and I know he'd had his ups and downs during the regular season. And then all of a sudden it, it became a real up along the way. So there are many examples yeah. of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I was going to ask you, who is uh, Tara Bachigalupa? I owe her a huge thank you, a huge thank you, because I had posted um, on my Instagram, like, hey, here's the top five goalies I want to, uh, I want to, I want to interview. And Tara responded and said, hey, here's Scott's email. Contact him. I'm like, great. Uh, well, you just, you just, you just made my life incredible, Damon, because Tara is my wife, actually. There you go. So <laughs> thank you for, thank you, thank you, thank you for, for uh, asking who she is. She's my wife. Um, and, um, and so anyway, she was uh, kind enough to respond. And I, I, I feel terrible because I know you had sent some emails along the way. And um, uh, anyway, uh, Oh, Good no for worries. You. We made it wife. happen. We yes. made it happen. That's the important yes. thing. And sometimes yes. uh, the good the good things are worth waiting. I got another little funny story. So I I tell my wife, uh, hey, I, I'm interviewing Scott Bachigalup, and she's she's from Argentina, right? So she she barely knows anything about lacrosse, let alone a goalie from the '90s. Um, and so the whole day, I'm kind of like practicing saying your name because I haven't said it all that much. And then right when you start the we start the podcast, I just I just butcher it. <laughs> Uh, but put it this way, Damon, you're in good hands because I, I've told many, many of people, uh, when I was a freshman at Princeton, you know, they would announce the starting lineups yeah. and it was awesome. So I'd, you know, it'd be like Princeton versus Brown and they'd be like, okay, starting lineups, attack midfield defenders. And then goal number 10, Scott. And it was always, you know, the announcers are usually some college student who's doing the announcing and, and learning it's Scott bag the and i would be like oh man like that sucks and then like as i got older sophomore junior people started figuring it out so by my senior year it was like you know it was like the people are like it's scott bachelupo and i was like oh they're finally getting to the whole thing so yeah. you you did a great job you All right. you, you got there it go. you got it early so you don't have to <laughs> worry about it yeah you've recovered um, one, uh, see, the name didn't come through, but she says, how do you get over the fear of getting hurt? Which is an interesting question, because I, um, I wouldn't say I ever had that fear. Did, did you? Did you, ever have, did you ever have any sort of, you know, fear of getting hurt when you were playing? I never had a fear of getting hurt. And I know, Damon, you and I talked about, you know, on the original uh, podcast about goalies in general. So no, I never had a fear of getting hurt. Um, but we did discuss with goalie coaches or coaches in general, you know, as you um, warm up goalies or as you coach goalies, you need to be very sensitive to not hurting them when mm -hmm. you are teaching them, right? So going back to why do we use tennis balls? Why do we use softballs? Why do people need to understand age appropriate way of of warming up a goalie or teaching a goalie. If you have an eight year old goalie, you're not throwing the ball hundred miles an hour at him to warm he or she up. You are doing it in a way that creates confidence um, and, 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 and making sure that they're not afraid of being hurt by the ball or I guess hurt by, you know, being hurt. So I think there's a lot to that, but, but, you know, I don't, you know, I was never worried about getting hurt as a, as a goalie, I guess, is the way I would say it, unless. Yeah. May, maybe, maybe I misread that. Were. Maybe I miss, I was thinking hurt, like, you know, twist a knee or, or yeah, you know, bust like, my knee or something bust like that. My knee my or shoulder. something like that. But maybe yeah. she's talking about fear of the ball. So I, I think you answered that, you know, you, you answered that perfectly. Um, and get padded up is the other thing I'd add there. Like there's no shame in, in, in wearing pads. There's no shame in wearing pads, David, but I believe there's a pride factor that goes in to those who don't wear. Uh, I believe being padded up is, is the correct statement. Although I will tell you that I know a lot of goalies 
don't wear, you know, don't wear many pads because they want to be as quick. They don't want to be bogged down by pads. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, uh, by the way, one of the, the greatest things I saw, and I'm surprised more goalies don't do it in today's world. Right. Because you have a helmet, a, a throat protector, a chest protector, gloves, a stick, a cup. And that's what you have, right? I wore sweatpants mm -hmm. to take the sting out. One of the things I'm surprised that that uh, girls and boys don't do more is wear football pants. Yeah. Right, because football pants are tight. You've got thigh pads and knee knee pads, and um, and so uh, I think that is like you still stay quick, but but you have some more protection. I don't see people doing it all too often. But uh, maybe if I was a younger goalie, maybe I would be doing that also. But um, being padded up with something like that, that allows you to be quick and not weighed down by, by pads might be a, a good thought. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Football pants. Uh, Gal John Galloway wore them. There's a, there's a Syracuse goalie, Matty Palin, who, who's a referee in, in college That's, and pro lacrosse wore them. And be, a lot of people Matty Palin was why I said it, Matty Palin. And there was a guy, Lee Hine that used to wear football pants. So yeah, totally agree with what well, I'm surprised more. Don't do it. Yeah. Um, Tara, Tara left a great comment. He said he still has the sweatpants. So I, I'm just envisioning you Sundays, you know, watching football, uh, wearing those black sweatpants. Okay. <laughs> Tara's done now. She's good. We're done. She <laughs> stuff. You don't have to talk to her anymore. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Landon wants to know what tips do you have to move the stick quicker? Uh, like kind of like hand speed and, and moving the stick quicker. Any, anything come to mind for you there? So uh, stick quicker, I would say there are a bunch of different drills. The, the, uh, when you talk about the, the, the uh, stick head of a goalie, and Damon, you know this very well because we were talking about different drills for goalies. That top hand is always the driving hand, right? And so how do you drive? I got my, my hand on the, on, the, on, the, on the top of the, the throat of the stick and I'm driving it towards the ball. Um, there's a lot of drills that people do where you actually you don't include the stick and you throw balls and you ask them to catch the ball with the top hand, right? How do I drive my hand towards the top to, to, to the, where the ball is going, um, and create quickness that way. So the top of your stick and that top hand being on the, on the throat of that stick, there's many like ball drills that you can do to become quick with how you move you, you move the stick. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that you can do is you create weights. And so um, uh, tell a goalie, give a goalie a stick that's got a really heavy um, pole and you put weights on the top of the stick head and you make them play goalie that way, right? So you, you make them play with a really heavy stick. So when you give them the regular stick, it feels so much lighter and then they therefore become much quicker. So there's many ways to kind of work on quickness of your stick head and, and moving it as a goalie. Yeah, love it. Love it. Um, you can also fill up the shaft with like sand or pennies. Sand, um, yeah. Yeah, and it gets super That's exactly heavy. exactly right. Then, yeah, anytime, like I love just adding a bunch of resistance um, or even just doing, you know, exercises like carrying like a, you know, weight, right? And then I'm just doing, walking the line, doing my, doing my saves. Yep. And then when you remove that resistance, guess what? You're so much quicker. That's You're so much quicker. Exactly, but then you have exactly this whole what other. We, we see so. Yep. Go ahead. Um, no, I was going to say, then you have this whole other element of the eye hand, you know, the eye hand of like seeing a, a, a ball coming at you and then getting your body moving. So I, I think there's certain drills that you can do. Um, I mean, whether it's just wall ball or like little hand eye drills with a partner um, that really help train your your, your eyes and then getting your, you know, getting your body reacting. Yeah. And, and by the way, I think all drills, uh, there's a bunch of drills with goalies that doesn't involve their stick that are great drills, right? It's always teaching about stepping to the ball and getting your body or your head or your whatever piece of your body behind the ball that's being shot to you. Those are all great drills for goalies to be moving and actually not, you know, we were always taught, don't rely on your stick, 
right? Don't rely on your stick as you're playing goalie. You should be relying on your mm -hmm. body mm -hmm. as the, as, because if you miss it, you want your body behind it. So any, any drill that requires you to drop your stick and you're moving with your body is a good drill for a goalie. Yep. Awesome. Um, Martin asks, what, what was your inspiration for becoming a goalie? Uh, well, there's no inspiration. Uh, it, it, it was, um, I think, I think we had talked about this in the past too. Um, most goalies in my mind were, um, for some odd reason, they were, they were, they had to go play goalie. And, and as I said to you, David, in sixth grade, they said we had an end of year scrimmage and they said, change all the positions. And I became a, uh, and I said, I'll, I'll go play goalie. And I, I played goalie. And that was my, be my first time ever playing goalie. And, and that's how I, I started my, my career. So I don't think I had inspiration, although I will tell you um, there are several goalies that are out there that were certainly inspirational when I became a goalie for, I think for all goalies. Right. And so when I was growing up, it was a lot of the St. Paul's um, boys who were, who were goalies like a Peter Sheehan, a Les Matthews and, and, and others. And then, and then, you know, when I was kind of early in my high school career, Larry Quinn was at Hopkins, who I used to watch a lot as a kid, you know, going to the Hopkins games um, at, in Baltimore. And so I had certainly a lot of inspirations and, and role models that I was thinking about. But I don't think I had any inspiration to play goalie. It just happened to come about. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, the dog wants to wants to come on in for some, some nice. Here. <laughs> um, we love it. So we heard, uh, you know, in the in the video we that I on I released on Tuesday, we sort of hear the story of the '92 game. Uh, in the podcast, you told the story of Coach Tierney, uh, you know, going for the walk at the at the 205 camp and him yep. contemplating losing. Connor wanted to know. We want to hear some more Coach Tierney stories. Uh, does that does any little story come to mind just i don't know some oddities or funny things that he used to do at practice or i i don't know anything come to mind for you um i ha i have i have too many coach tierney stories um that that is a uh that is a 10 hour podcast that damon you and i have to do about stories with with coach tierney and stories between him and and our coaching our coaching staff um Coach T, uh, I, I, I don't have any stories about Coach T. Coach T was an incredible coach. He was an incredible um, uh, driver of excellence. He created a tremendous amount of confidence and in an in a, in a unbelievable environment um, at Princeton. And, and what I would say is that um, he was such a supporter of all of us while while we were there and 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 in essence he really became you know for me for coach charity to me was uh he recruited me he was my head coach he became a mentor and then and then the evolution was he just became a friend mm -hmm. right and so that's kind of the life cycle of how i think about coach t is 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 that and 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 every phase was a little bit different, right? He he treated me differently during those phases, and um, a, a, as I had to treat him differently. Um, uh, but 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 he a, a fiery coach, right? We all know his antics on the sidelines. Um, um, you know really knew how to press people's buttons to get the best out of them along the way. Um, respectful of all of us when we played for him. Um, and and um, more, more importantly, um, was, was completely thoughtful towards there's more to lacrosse. There, there's more to life than just lacrosse. And so for Princeton men's lacrosse, he always knew that there was something else that we, 
right? No, no one plays pro lacrosse. And so he always knew there was something else for all of us. And, um, and so he always understood that there was a higher calling for us than just lacrosse. And so um, uh, lots of stories um, that can't be shared or repeated, but we'll keep them <laughs> in the inner sanctum of, of my head. I love it. I love it. Um, I'm going to try and get him after the, this lacrosse season this summer, I'm, I'm going to try and get him on the podcast. Um, All right. I, it'd be, be amazing. I mean, even though he's you know not a goalie, but just to pick his brain on, on lacrosse, I'm sure you could agree that it'd be a wonderful conversation. Bill Tierney is, is the greatest lacrosse coach in the history of lacrosse. I'll help you, Damon, try to get that done. <laughs> so I will make a personal plea with him if I if, if that works for you and um he actually funny enough um even though he's not a, a goalie coach uh, Bill Tierney is one of the best goalie coaches out there um surprisingly and uh he used to warm me up a lot and we used to talk a lot and I think he'd surprise you with his his acumen around goalies and and how to teach them and 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 whatnot. So I actually think it would be okay. a very enjoyable conversation for you. Amongst yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll I'll probably hit you up this summer. <laughs> I got a two yeah, pronged right. approach. I, I have a good relationship yeah. with uh, with Trevor too. So we got a two two pronged approach. We yeah. can attack it. <laughs> if you can go through Trevor, you win. Uh, I can yeah, only there you go. I can only I can only encourage along the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jared asks, how do I get better at talking to my defense? Uh, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on communicating as a goalie? Great, great question. Um, I believe goalies have, um, there are, I think a goalie has two jobs when they walk on the field. Their first job is to save the ball. And their second job is to lead the defense and leading the defense is communication. I believe that defense, 80% of defense is communication, not actually, it, it's not It's not the actual defensive philosophies, it's just communicating with one another. So for goalies, um, what I would say is this, if you're a young goalie and you're learning, your job is to go save the ball. As you become more comfortable being a goalie and you think you can take on more, more you should be the captain of that defense and you should communicate. And communicate to me means this, as a goalie, you should know the defense better than anybody else on the team. You should understand where everyone is going at all times. It is the quarterback. If you're the quarterback of a football team, you go in the huddle and you call the play, your job is to know where everyone's supposed to go. Well, if you're a goalie, you need to communicate and you need to understand where everyone needs to go, whether it's the slide package, whether it's man to man, whether you're 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 four on three, whether you're in a zone, whether you know what are you trying to accomplish? That's what a goalie does, and, and so you need to become comfortable with that, and and you need to work on that. And so uh, uh, you know, going back to Coach T and 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 Dave Metzbauer, you know, my freshman year, they told me you just save the ball. It's all you need to go is to go save the ball, and. Um, and then as I got older and I got, I started understanding the defense, they said, okay, your job is to go leave the defense while saving the ball and my communication uh, of, of doing that. So, so it doesn't happen overnight. You need to be a student of your defense and the philosophies. Um, but don't, don't ever forget your number one job is to save the ball. And then, and then you kind of go from there when you think about communicating with the defense and, and how you're going to effectively communicate, save it. I get comfortable. I've gotten a little bit older, a little wiser, and now I can communicate and lead the defense along the way. Yeah, love it. It's a question that people ask me all the time. So I've thought about this one tre tremendously and I've asked so many goalies like this exact question. And so a couple other things I'll, th I'll throw in there. And, and your point about like, I think we talked about it on the podcast, you know, if the communication is getting in the way of you making saves, like focus on making saves because you're the only one who can make those saves. Yep. Um, other, other people on your team can, um, can uh, help with the communication. Uh, one thing, you know, how do I get better talking to my defense? Um, use names, use names, you know, people respond to their names 
And like you said, Batch, you know, you know the defense better than anyone. So you would never say like, who's hot? Who's number one? Like, why, why, would, you say, why would you say that to your defense? You know, you know who's hot. The quarterback doesn't say who's the hot route. Like he, he knows, like he, you yep. know it better than anyone. You use names and you um, project, like work on yeah. really projecting your voice. Yep. I agree. And, and by the way, I'll, I, I'll give you like a, um, I tell goalies this every once in a while. Um, uh, you should be able to be, as you get to a higher level and you get to be quite good, you should be a goalie who can almost close their eyes and tell the defense where to go. Right. How do you, how do you, how do you close your eyes and, and, and tell the, and, and know where the defense is supposed to go. Right. Balls top left. I know you're hot. I know you're pinching. You should almost be able to close your eyes and, and, and orchestrate the defense. That's how well you know the defense and, and, and what you're all trying to accomplish. That, that to me is like that's the next level of, of great goalies and, and how well they can communicate and, and tell their, their players where they need to go. And to your point, calling them by name, tone. Um, you, you know, for me, it became high pitched, right? Everyone used to laugh at me, but like when I wanted someone to slide, my 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 pitch went sky high, uh, and but it was effective for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I love so much about that about this video that I released on Tuesday is like there's this one angle where like the camera is like right over top of your guy's huddle, um, kind of going into. I think it's going into the overtime. And Coach Tierney, it kind of sounds like he says, we go 100, but we have the ball. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you remember like what 100 was? Like someone someone asked yeah, what. Yeah, sure. 100 was, you know, many, many people run 100, but it's an it's a offensive set, right? So think about it. He was saying, uh, essentially what, what, what Coach T was saying is we have the ball that can't score, so make sure we, we have the ball. Um, it's okay to be patient. And um, I don't know exactly the the one hundred set, uh, but effectively it was it's a it's a it stacks, and um, you know maybe sweeping across the top and 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 looking. But his, his point was having the ball, make sure that the other team doesn't score, and that Got was it. always our offensive. That was our philosophy when we first started at Princeton was if we have the ball, they can't score. I mean, it's a pretty effective defensive strategy when you play that way, but that's, that's 100. 100 is a, is a hold the ball and, 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 and it's a, it's a circle, but it was, um, it was a way for us to play offense. Got it. Awesome. Uh, well, I love that shot. I mean, it's just like, and especially the way that the, the video editor that I, I got, his name's Tyler. He, um, he did it like, cause you go, and then we go into the huddle and then it like goes right into that thing. Cause it's like, like you're there. It was really cool. Really cool effect. Yep. Um, how, how about a, did you have a, a favorite teammate or a favorite set of teammates at Princeton? No, I, I didn't have a, I didn't have a favorite teammate. I certainly am. Um, 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 I'm biased. My class of 1994, there was, uh, there was 10 of us in that class. And so um, certainly were my, my dear friends, but I didn't have a, 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 a best friend or a certain group of friends on, on the team. The, 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 gr the great thing about Princeton lacrosse back when I played, and I think this is probably um, like, most, my, like most folks would say if they're on girls or boys teams in college, but um, when I showed up at Princeton, if there was 40 guys in the team, I had 40 good, I had 40 great friends, 40 best friends when I showed up as a freshman. And so that was the culture we had at Princeton was, um, you know, you've got these dear friends that are, that are willing to accept you as soon as you show up. And that was, that was amazing for, for all of us. So um, we were, we were all that whole team throughout my four years, we were all very close with one another. And by the way, we were very close with all the, the coaching staff. Also, I mean, um, I used to go out to dinner every Friday night before a lacrosse game with, with Dave Metzbauer. So, so Metzi and I went to dinner every, every Friday night um, together. So um, 
uh, I didn't have a best friend, but we all certainly were very close. Very close. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, Joe Unitas says, tell Batch, Joe Unitas says hello. We played football together <laughs> at St. Paul's. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and he, t- he tells a little story here in the, in the, he said, he, he there's first game of the season. I got, I got beat on an up and out. I guess you were a senior. He was a freshman and the wide receiver dropped the ball. When I got back to the huddle, Batch was vocal and letting the freshman know that I shouldn't get beat again. Batch was a god in high school, and this freshman was more scared of letting him down than getting yelled at by the coaches. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, as you can tell, uh, well, Joe Unitas is a is a he was a great athlete and obviously wonderful at, at when he was at St. Paul's. And um, you you may or may not recognize his last name along the way. So um, his, his father was was a huge supporter of St. Paul's and gave a lot of time to us also. So 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 Joey and, and, and his father were great was a great family for us at St. Paul's. So we're always always very thankful for that. Awesome. Awesome. Any um someone asked a cool question. Any cool rituals that you guys did as a team, Princeton lacrosse team, um, that maybe are still going on today, but if they're not, that's okay. Um, a- anything come to mind for you for that? Uh, I, if there's rituals, I don't remember Damon. It's probably a very long time ago. We certainly had a few things along, along the way. Um, and I don't, I don't know if they're carried on or, or, or not. Um, Princeton does have one thing that uh, we've kept is we've sponsored John Hess, who was a, John Hess, who if people don't know, he's a very famous player for Princeton. He graduated in 98. John um, has been a, a, a part of the lacrosse community for a long time at Princeton. And um, we, we have a thing where we, you, you, um, you, know, you support your, your number. So you donate money and it goes towards the locker room and your number. So, right. So I was number 10, you give, you give money. It supports the locker room and the, and the kid and the Jersey. And, you know, the, the, the kids know the lineage of the number that they have, right? So whoever's number 10 at Princeton now will know that it was me and Dennis Kramer and a, and a whole bunch of others that, that wore the number 10. So we certainly have some of those traditions, but I don't remember any tradition that probably I could tell you on this podcast that is worth, <laughs> worth talking about, put it that way. Awesome. Well, that, that's actually a really cool idea that, that kind of you know, sponsor your own number. Um, I was number 30. So I don't know who was number 30 on Princeton. Back in your I have day, to I mean. think about that, David. Yeah. Why don't, you, why don't we go to some some other questions and I'll think about number 30 along <laughs> it's the, the way. It's not that important. <laughs> I'm just curious. Um, someone asked the save in OT. I mean, what what you know, what a game of inches, right? I mean, if that ball's like what, another inch, inch and a half higher, like Syracuse is the champion. But the shot comes and I mean it it kind of looks like you know, it's coming from like pretty close and maybe catches you off guard a little bit. And you just kind of like, you know, give it, give it a little shoulder. Did it, did it like tag you right in the shoulder? Yeah. So uh, the shot is, uh, by the way, Andy Moe was playing defense. Um, if you watch, it's Dom Finn for Syracuse. Dom Finn, uh, uh, all American phenomenal player for Syracuse for, for, all, for, for all those years. Um and when Dom snapped it off, it hit it 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 hit my shoulder. I kind of did a shrug. Mm-hmm. And we could all debate, you know, as Damon, as you know, we can all debate whether I um, put myself in that position to make the save or whether that was Dom hitting me in the shoulder. Um, but one of the ways, w- w- one way or the other, it it hit my shoulder and shot. If you see it, shot off to the right and went out of bounds you know, goal line extended from there. Um, and, and what's really super interesting is that that was a great save. I don't think they have it on video anymore, but, um, you know, Tom Marichek, cause they had the ball for the first couple of minutes of that first overtime, Marichek got the ball and uh, typical Tom, he took a behind the back shot in overtime. And, 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 oh. and, and, and let's be very clear, Tom Marichek taking a behind the back shot is a great shot. Right. Don't think it's fancy or he was trying to show off for Tom behind the back was like his left hand. Like, so it was a great shot. 
and uh, it hit my toe. And then after it hit my toe, it hit the pipe and it went out of bounds and, and they, and they picked up from there. And um, as I, as I've said, we, we played amazing defense and lucky enough to get the ball back at that point from there. But Tom also had an amazing shot that fortuitously hit my, my foot and off the pipe along the way. Interesting. I didn't, I didn't, yeah, I didn't get into this. That's not on the video that I had, but that's. that's yeah. Unfortunately, the, the, the videos back then were not exactly like ESPN quality that you guys get these days. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, this is a lacrosse goalie show. There is no debate about whether Dom Finn hit you or you made the save. You made the save. You made the save. Come on. Dom Finn, Dom Finn would debate you all day, every day about that. And I, he still I will, texts me about it every blue moon, to die so. on. That's a hill I'm willing to die on. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. What about, what about um, did you guys get a lot of press coverage back, you know, back in the early 90s at Princeton? And what, what was that like for you? Um, uh it was actually really cool what was going on with the press back then. So uh, this is early nineties. We're at Princeton. I would say that New, the state of New Jersey was at the, you know, earlier stages of lacrosse. Um, and certainly there was some schools that were playing lacrosse at a high level, Del Martins and the, and the likes, but the state of New Jersey was not exactly a hotbed of lacrosse when, when we all showed up at Princeton. And and I, and what was really great was as as we went through the evolution of Princeton lacrosse, uh, the media started picking up on this team at Princeton. Right, we we won in '92. It was the first national championship that the, the school had won in forty some odd years. It was back in the 1940s when we last won a national championship, and so the the the, uh, the media attention started skyrocketing. Right, the Trenton Times, the newspapers, uh, the local, um, uh, the, lo the local uh, TV stations, um, and, and, and what it led to was, and Coach T was great at this, was you know we would then go out and we were doing all these lacrosse clinics, right? We were we were um, going to um, you know schools and helping with little kids play lacrosse, and. And so I would say that we were at the beginning innings of like lacrosse blowing up in the state of New Jersey and the media coverage, you know, kind of was reminiscent of, of that, where um, I don't think anybody covered Princeton lacrosse in 1988. And then all of a sudden, you know, by my senior year, it was interviews and the papers and the articles about the games coming up. And the, oh, by the way, the uh, attendance for our home games went skyrocketing. I mean, to the, to the point where they had to build a stadium because the attendance became so big. Um, you know, we, we used to play in a field that, you know, probably could handle uh, 50 people. <laughs> and, and by my senior year, there was, you know, a couple thousand people showing up for a home game, which is really exciting. So uh, all of that, you know, you could, the, the, the trajectory of it looked much like our, our, championships and, and winning it, it all kind of came about so uh, it was a lot of fun awesome yeah it sounds like a lot of fun um cool uh let's see uh jared asked another question how do i get better at tracking the ball because sometimes the ball will go in the net without me seeing it hmm tough one damon i don't know you might be able you might be better at the answer in this one than <laughs> than, than me um, I, I, I guess I would say is that, um, you know, you, you, uh, I, I guess the one thing I would say is if you're having a tough time tracking the ball, um, for a lot of goalies, we always talk to them about, you know, when you're, when you're in the, when you're in the crease and the offense has the ball, uh, you have to focus on the ball being in that and the shooters or that offensive person's stick. Don't look at their eyes. Don't look at their hips. Don't look at their bodies. Your, your job is to stare at the ball in their stick, right? That's your focus. And so we always are constantly telling goalies, um, it, don't look at the player. The ball is in that, you know, that, that girl or boy stick. That's your focus. 
and you have to be paying attention at all times, right? Every shooter can be, every person on offense is a shooter. So you have to make sure you, you are paying attention at all times on that ball being in the stick, not their eyes, not their body, not their hips, not their, not their feet, not what's going on. It's focus on that ball in the, in the, in the cross of their stick. I think that's spot on. I think that's spot on. I think, I think, you know, how do I get better at tracking the ball Uh, reps experience, you know, like how many shots a week are you, are you, are you taking? Um, Probably not enough. You know, if, if you're not seeing the ball, because you know, if you're seeing 300 shots a week, all different types, right? All yep. different types. Then all of a sudden, like now when someone is on the run and they kind of come at this angle, I kind of know I've seen that shot before. I've seen that shot a thousand times before. So I kind of know where that release is going to be. And I can pick it up a little quicker. So to me, well, no, the, I totally agree with that. And Damon, the other thing I would tell the goalies is make sure um, when you're being warmed up and to your point about the shots, um, and we all can debate how many shots you should see, but uh, a, a great goalie warm up doesn't just involve one person standing stationary and shooting the ball at you. I would say great goalie warm ups and the repetition is is two people, right? Someone feeding the shooter, right? Feeding from behind to top left, top right, feeding to the crease. Someone throwing the ball from 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 whatever from the alley to an attack and that's trying to sneak in, you know, you, you want to be warmed up with the ball moving, not just someone taking the ball and shooting on you. It's got to be someone passing the ball. So you're following the ball from back left to top, right for a shot. You know, you want your feet moving when you're doing that. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, that's part of tracking, right? It's like, yeah, Yeah, that's right. That's exactly why I say it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I can track it when someone's just shooting at shooting at me and I pass it right back to him. He shoots at me and I pass it right back to him. But can you be on the right pipe and go to top left and then and then track it? So I think that's great. Correct. Great. Tip. Yep. I agree. Yeah. A um, couple more questions. You got you got a few more minutes. Yeah. Keep going. All right. Tara, did, Tara doesn't need me yet, Damon. So okay. I'm, I'm good for a little bit longer. Well, I think she's still on or maybe does she... No, oh, she's still on. She's still on. All right. So we're, we're no, okay. Still- there you go. <laughs> um, by the way, I just looked at the, the attendees. We got Dave Mitzbauer on too. Big, Metsy. Big <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, and, and Jeff way who went to my alma mater Cal back in 85 go bears. I love it. There you go. Good. Um, uh, the question is, you know, how do you see the game being different? How has it changed? Um, maybe for the bet, maybe for better, maybe for worse. Like what, what is your, what is your thoughts on that one? It's kind of a big, broad, open question, but I'm curious. Yeah. A couple, couple thoughts. I think the, so high level, I think the game has, has, has evolved for the better. I think the game is more exciting today than it's ever been. Um, I think there are better athletes playing the game of lacrosse today than they were back when I was playing men and women. Um, I think the equipment's better. I do think the sticks for, for, for the people on the field are better, better than ever. And I, therefore I think it's made it harder on goalies in general. Uh, I think kids can shoot the ball harder and from different angles based on the sticks that they have today than they did probably back when I was playing. Um, I love the growth in the game. When I played, it was regional still. It was it was regional starting to go national, right? So Baltimore, Long Island, upstate, and and Denver and some other hotbeds were were kind of the place where lacrosse was done. And that's where a lot of the recruits came from. Massachusetts and others. And in today's world, it's a national sport. I love hearing kids from California and Florida and 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 Oregon and um, all, uh, you know, Texas, those were not states that were the hotbeds. And so I think it's a national sport and that means it's a broader sport and that means it's a great game and, 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 the, and the sport is growing. I think all of those things are super positive and I'm thrilled uh, you know, to be a part of kind of the older world. And I, and I love every bit of what's happened to the game, the game of lacrosse to, in, in today's world. Um, 
and 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 even more international now than it, than it ever was, right? So, you know, when they play the world world games and the countries that are playing, there's more countries playing now than ever. And I'd be the first one to raise my hand that hopes that lacrosse for both women and men become a Olympic sport. I think that would be just amazing. Lacrosse used to be Olympic sport. I don't know if many people know that, but back in the yeah. 20s and 30s, it was an Olympic sport. Um, and then obviously not enough people played it. So I'd love to see the game of lacrosse become an Olympic sport at some point, because that means internationally it has grown um, along the way. Love it. Love it. Speaking of equipment, this, um, Scott, this right here is the STX Eclipse 2, and it has something called a pocket, a pocket, yeah. which, your, which your stick really, really did not have. And you realize if you had no. one of these, you might not have committed that that air because <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think the pockets they put in these sticks these days are yeah. beautiful. Damon, I'm going to start going with that. Now I'm just going to blame that last play in the 92 in the, in the 92 on my stick, not me. It wasn't me anymore. Right. It was my stick. Right. 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 And um, I'll blame Metsy too. If he's still listening, cause he used to stream my stick. So I'll blame him for doing <laughs> that to me then. Right. Oh, if I can ever pass the buck on that. I will. I love it. Well, Scott, thanks so much for taking the time to answer everyone's questions. I think, I think we got them all. Um, if you guys got some other last minute questions, let me know. Um, otherwise I will say thanks again for, for telling that story. Um, I think, I think it's an amazing story. I'm going to do my darndest to get it out there. Um, I'm going to try and interview some other folks who were involved and kind of build. I really think this is amazing. So uh, we yeah, may be talking great. shortly in the future. Oh, great. Well, well, Damon, um, Thank you so much. I'm glad you reached out. Um, it's nice to have an old guy, I guess, talk a little bit. So I'm the older guy, but anyway, you do a great job and, and um, you know, goalies, goalies are a special breed and um, you and I both agree. It's the, it's the most important uh, position on the field and, and special people have to become goalies in lacrosse. And so um, for any goalie, um, that's out there, you, you know, you're special and you're the focus point uh, of that team. And, um, and you should feel great about playing that position because it's the toughest position on the field. And um, I'm biased, you're biased, but for the goalie community, we're all in it together. And, uh, and so I respect anybody that wants to play goalie as, as a, in, in the game of lacrosse. I love it. Scott, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, everyone, for attending. We will see you soon. Have a great evening. Be well. Take care. Thanks, Damon. Yep, thank you.